probably not, but we, towards the end, maybe we'll just play it by ear. Thank you. We got more lights here than last year. <laughs> <laughs> How are you all doing? Good? Well, these are great days in which we are living. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. Is that okay? Yes. Because, you know, the Bible says you shall know the truth and it will set you free. Yes. And so, you know, we're going to look at some things tonight. The days in which we are living are awesome days. They are frightening days. And we can't ignore, you, we can't go through life and say, oh, well, hallelujah, everything's great. Everything is not great unless you're walking closely with the Lord. And so, you know, there's the goodness and the severity of the Lord. There's light and there is darkness. And we need to understand the days in which we are living. I want to thank all those folk who prayed for us. Um, my son, Mark, was very, very sick, very, very ill on the edge under attack of the enemy. And, uh, and we, you know, it's been like that over the last few months. And we appreciate all of your prayers. You know, we don't have a church, so... And um, we live in a place where we, I hate to say this, we don't go to church. <laughs> there is no church <laughs> where we live. <laughs> but, you know, so we rely on you people, you know, to pray for us and stand with us. Because um, the days in which we live, dangerous times, but glorious times. Some places are, are tagged, as it were, as refuges in these last days. Lancaster is one of them. There are other cities in the United States and other places around the world, like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. There are places where places are of refuge. And, uh, you know, I've heard it said, well, all we need to do is trust in the Lord. And that sounds really good, but it's a bit naive. It's trust and obey. There is no other way. We need both. And uh, we cannot be blasé about the times in which we are living. We need to understand them. And, uh, you know, we're living in time, these times which were we really need to understand what's going on. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about some of these things, you know. You know, it says in the days of Noah, in Hebrews 11 and verse 7, it says, but by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not as yet seen, moved with fear to prepare an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. So it was Noah was warned of God. And he didn't just say, trust God. He had to do certain things. And if he didn't, he wouldn't have survived. You hearing me? Really important. And uh, he warned, that word warned signified and implied that we, if we don't hear what God is saying, we're going to be in jeopardy of ourselves and our families. And so, you know, the word fear, it says moved by fear. It's not the normal Hebrew word for fear. It means to be circumspect, to be prudent, and to be careful. So it's by faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen, moved circumspectly, carefully with prudence. And he got his family through the difficult times in which he was living. And it's very foolish to say, you know, God will take care of everything, just trust the Lord. No, that trusting the Lord is part of it, but there are also conditions which we have to understand and move in. You know, 
I think because the times are, we come in to the end of one dispensation and entering into another, and time is running out, so I really need to be candid with you, if that's all right, you know? Uh, and it's, you know, you know, during the communist uprising in, in China, in the Boxer Revolution, and the communists were coming down, and the pastors were telling the churches, their churches, that everything will be all right, God will take care of them, and uh, he might even rapture you before it gets here, but God hasn't appointed us to you to tribulation. And thousands of them died. And those who got out with the commander Chiang Kai-shek went to Taiwan and were saved. Those Christians who came under terrible persecution held their pastors responsible and said, you did not tell us the truth. And there are pastors out there which God will hold you responsible because you are not telling your people the truth. It is not just going to be all right. There are difficult times ahead. And so we need to understand that. Hallelujah. The days of Noah. We're living in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And so we need to understand that. I'm sure you're aware, we're all aware now of the prophetic signs of the blood moons and, you know, we're living in the last day and we're coming up to the last blood moons in September. There'll be no more on consecutive feast days in a Shemitic year. There'll be no more of these for over 100 years. This is the last one. You know, and, you know, there's a lot of teaching about, against the, you know, oh, keep your eye on the Lord, don't worry about the blood moons. You know, the Bible tells us that God set them in the heavens as a voice for signs and seasons. And if you're saying, just don't worry about the blood moons, saying, don't worry about what God is saying. Let's be frank, come on. It's we're too far down the road, do you know, to, to, to not tell the truth. We're living in those days. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth forth its handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech. Talking about the stars, the moon, sun. Day unto day they utter speech. And night unto night they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, no language, where the voice of the stars is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout the whole earth and their words to the end of the world. To ignore that is to ignore God, what he's saying to us. And so we need to understand that. And so these are the days in which we are living. Hallelujah. Western nations who have a heritage of Christianity are primed now for judgment and blessing. Western nations, such as America, Canada, England, Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, they are primed because of the, they are covenant nations in a sense, they, they were birthed under Christian principles which they have now forsaken. And so, understanding this, because of the forsaking of the basic commandments and precepts of the word of God and God, and uh, the church must take responsibility for this. Not the people, not the governments. The church has to take responsibility. We are the light of the world. Not the government. The church, you are the light of the world. The Bible says, he said, first, he said, I am the light of the world. And then later he said, you are the light of the world. Set on a hill. Let your light shine. And he said, if you don't do that, you'll be trodden on the foot of ungodly men. And that's exactly what has happened across the Western nations. There's some good news, believe me. 
you know, I'm not given to sensationalism. I like to, the truth is truth, and that's it, you know? And it's not sensationalism. You know, and God has already given us an extension of time to get things right. But that has come to an end. It comes to an end next month. And so we need to understand that. Time has now run out. And so we need to be very clear on this. First of all, we need to be clear on the nature and character of God. God is good. He is capable of acting out of any motivation other than that of love. And so when judgments come, it's to, they are redemptive judgments to turn us back to God. When that is the last resort God has, he will do that in order to redeem us. And so we understand that. Oh, yes. God often extends time, you know, and grace. He did that in the days of Noah. He extended the time, he extended the time. Because I'll talk about it a bit later, but God, Enoch knew that when his son Methuselah died, the flood was going to come. And this poor guy couldn't die because God had extending the time. He became the oldest man who ever lived on the earth. That is the grace of God. And when he died, that year the flood came. See, God is good. Oh, hallelujah. You know, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, Luke 17, 26, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, drink, and when their married wives were given in marriage until the day that they entered into the ark, the flood came and destroyed them. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking, but they were living as if they had another thousand years. They didn't understand the days in which they lived. How much of the church is living like that right now? I had someone preaching oh, the other week that, you know, we might have another thousand years before the millennium. I said, God help us if we have another thousand years, you know. You know, the mindset. You know, it's so, it, it's, it's interesting. And again, you know, Luke 17, 28, like, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, drink, they bought, they sold, they planted, they lived life as if it was just normal and didn't know what was on the horizon. Even so, Jesus said, thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man will be revealed. What does that mean? Everybody's waiting for the return of the Lord, but first he's going to be revealed to this entire world through you and I. That's where it starts. They're going to see Jesus through us. And he will be revealed through us before he comes for us. And it says, they're living in these days now, when the Son of Man will be revealed through us, in the days ahead in an incredible way, to bring in the harvest. These are the days. Jesus, you know, said this about the days of the times of Noah and the times of Lot, both of them. Not just the times of Noah, but the times of Lot. And things were so bad in Sodom and Gomorrah that actually God came down to really see if it was true. He actually came down from heaven to see if it was true. It says in Genesis 18 and verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham in the plains of Mamre and sat in the door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran out to meet them at the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. You know, this was long after the days of Noah, but he came down to see what was going on. And he was checking out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Genesis 18 in verse 20 said, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, 
And because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether this is true. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. See, the main sin, the Bible tells us the main sin in Sodom and Gomorrah was homosexuality. And he said, I'm coming down to see if this is really true. I'm coming down to myself in person to see if this is right. See, we're living in these days. We're living in these times. He said, I'll come down. Genesis 19 and verse 1, and there came two angels to Sodom, even at even, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose to meet them. These were angels, and he bowed themselves to his face towards the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my Lord, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and stay the night here, and we'll wash your feet. These were angels. They were so used to the supernatural. They would say, come in, we'll wash your feet. You're talking to angels. And uh, they come into your servant's house and go your ways. And they said, no, but we will abide in the street all night. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. He pressed on them, come inside of the house. And they baked him some bread and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, come past the house, both young and old, all the people of every quarter, and called unto Lot and said unto them, Where are the men which came into you this night? Bring them out to us so that we might know them. That was a sexual term, that we might know them. You see, they didn't realize they were taking on angels. And they were about to storm the house. The angel opened the door, flipped his hand, and they all went blind. The prevailing sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord said, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah has come up to me. I'm going to go down and assess the situation myself. That's what God is doing right now. History has shown that homosexuality opens the door to grave, other grave sins. Homosexuality is just the tip of the iceberg. It's what, that else, what else that brings in. We need to talk about this. We have to stand on the word of God. We cannot compromise on, on, on these issues. And so from the homosexual level, it all came down to such sins as having relationships with animals. It was all there in the Word. There are now applications before the Supreme Court for threesomes to be able to marry. Two men and one woman, or two women and one man. See, when you start this whole thing, you know, of equal rights, is a minefield of where that can take you. So, there's an application also before the Supreme Court to be able to marry their pets. It's right now before the Supreme Court in America. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You know where that will lead. I don't have to explain that to you. Equal rights. Leviticus 18, 22 says, Thou shalt not lie mankind with mankind and womankind. It is an abomination. Very simple. That's what God says. It's not what I'm saying. It's what God is saying. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast of the field and defile yourself with it. See, mixing of the seed. Jesus made it very clear that we are now living in these times, the days of Noah and the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, the days of, Lot, days of Lot. And it would be foolish to bury our heads in the sand. We've now reached the same level 
of deprivation. And we can expect the same things to happen. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah was taken out by basically volcanoes. And uh, the whole cities were wiped out. Now, we've had predictions of all kinds of earthquakes and volcanoes, particularly by the San Andreas fault line. It's poised. You know, you've heard about Lele for years now, but it's going to happen. There are big earthquakes coming to Los Angeles. Big, not small. Method earthquakes. The Lord took me, and I didn't know where I was, to a place that was in America, and I had no idea where I was. And I said, Lord, where is this place? And uh, what are we here for? What, what? And, and I had no idea where in America I was. And he said, you were in the, the Yellowstone National Park. And he said to me, come. And we went down. And there were two areas underneath the Yellowstone National Park, two separate areas, one deeper than the other, where volcanoes were brewing to erupt that would take an earthquake to trigger it. But it wasn't one, it was two areas underneath. See, the whole, what they call the Ring of Fire from New Zealand up through the uh, east coast of Australia, up through Japan, over the crop to Alaska, is all primed to go. It's happening in different places now, but the whole ring of fire is primed to go. <laughs> There'll be an earthquake in Japan that will destroy the stock exchange in Tokyo and a dramatically affect the economy in Asia, which will have a roll-on effect into the Western world. What is causing all this? The same conditions that prevailed in the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Same conditions here. Aren't you glad you know the Lord? Yeah. Hallelujah. It's exciting in some ways because we're coming down to the end and the return of Jesus. In your day, your day, your day. Hang on, don't die yet. It's coming. <laughs> if you do die, go out praising the Lord, you know? <laughs> Same conditions now are present in, in many, many nations. Something is going to happen this month which will affect what will happen next month. I don't know what it is. All I saw was I saw a linchpin being pulled out of a wheel and the wheels fell off. And I thought, maybe that's the economy. I wasn't sure. But something in August was going to trigger that. It's either some legislation or I don't know what it is. But I saw it very, very clearly. Oh, the times of Noah. You know, Enoch was alive during most of the life of Noah. They all knew each other. And uh, Noah would have known Enoch, and Enoch knew Adam. Right? Interesting. They would have talked. Because, you know, these guys lived to eight, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years. You know, they live long, long lives. And uh, <laughs> in the Bible tells us, you know, that, that Enoch, after his son was born, Methuselah, it says Enoch walked with God. Now, what happened to cause him to walk with God? He said, after the Enoch, his son, was born, he began to walk with God. Why? You know, when Mark was born, I didn't begin to walk with God. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> it's very, very interesting. You know, Enoch was given, Enoch was the seventh from Adam, generation from Adam. We're now living in the seventh day. 
Very interesting. Enoch was given insight to what was coming. He also had the timing of at least two events, one the flood and the, the secondly the coming of the Lord. He named his son Methuselah. You know, the meaning, they used to name people after we had meanings to their names back then. We don't do it so much these days, but you know, the name, the name he had meaning. And the, the name Methuselah is found in Genesis 4.18. It means death or the grave. The, the name Methuselah is a derivative of the same of the name Methuselah. However, Methuselah has an added meaning, which means a man of the dart or an arrow. And it's, it's interesting, because in the book of Enoch, it says when the arrow falls to the ground, it will come. In other words, when Enoch, when, when Methuselah dies, it's coming, it will come. That's why the poor guy couldn't, kept extending the time and grace, he couldn't die. But when he eventually died, you know, Enoch was 65 years old when Methuselah was born, Genesis 5, 21. And he knew when his son died, the flood would come. When Enoch was 65, he was born. Now, the Bible tells us that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. 600 is the end of all flesh. It's the number of the end of all flesh. That was the year, Genesis 7, 6, when Methuselah died. Methuselah died, and that year, the flood came. So, Enoch saw something coming, and he named his son in connection with it. And when it came, it happened. He saw what was coming and began to walk with God like never before in his life. Look, I want to tell you, if there are days now when we need to walk with God, we see what is coming. And we need to walk with God, just like Enoch did. It was coming, he saw it, you know, and he said, he began to walk with God. The problem is, sadly, the great majority of the church doesn't see the coming of this flood. And it doesn't motivate them to walk with God. It's life as usual. Eating, drinking, marrying. They're not wrong. But that's going through life as if, you know, it's just normal. It is not normal anymore. We're coming down to the wire. There are a lot of false voices out there telling their people the wrong thing. And they're going to be held accountable for doing that. Oh, hallelujah. Good thing is, Noah rode through the storm. He saw what was coming. He was prudent. He was wise. He prepared an ark. It took a long time to build. He had really, hundreds of years to build that blooming ark. But he knew. He kept on. This is what God said. But us, we've just got a, well, we haven't got a few years left. It's right on top of us. It's time to walk with God. And God's going to give you the grace to do that like never before. If that's what you really want with all of your heart, grace is coming to enable you to begin to do that. Yes. To walk with God. You know, things have been reserved for this generation which were not reserved for other generations. And you are living in it right now. And Noah rode through the storm and came out into a brand new world. I tell you, America is going to ride, you've got to ride through what is coming for the republic to rise again of a nation that will be honored by God. He rode through the storm. Oh, hallelujah. The problem is with the church, they're not seeing what's coming. God said he wouldn't flood the earth again, but there's a lot worse coming. And we must survive it. Hallelujah. 
I tell you, if we're not motivated to walk with God by the days in which we now are living, there's something wrong with us. Complacency was the issue in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. Complacency, I'll be all right. God will take care of us. Our pastor told us that. Well, he told you a lie. If you're not walking with God, you don't see what is coming and be motivated to walk with him. We're not going to make it. You want me to tell you the truth, don't you? Yes. Noah rode through it above the storm. Came out into a brand new world. An exciting world. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And the next verse says, it, and you know, in Acts, it is repeated in Acts chapter 2 and verse 20 where it says this, and the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great a notable day of the Lord. And it says, In that day, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. See, the church hasn't been raptured. We're still here, saving souls. Come on. The times that are going to come upon us, People are going to be so desperate that God is going to make it so easy to come to him. Whosoever just calls out to God for help shall be saved. And that's the basis of a massive harvest that's going to come in. Oh, hallelujah. You know, we've been saying for years, you know, Charles Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities. When I was a kid in school in England, that was mandatory reading. We had to read all stuff of Charles Dickens, you know, and it, wasn't easy for young little kids, but anyway, <laughs> we know the first phrase, you know, it, it's <laughs> of this novel, The Tale of Two Cities. It's talking about um, London and Paris during, during the turmoil of the French Revolution. England was saved from it, but Paris, Eng France was not. I want to tell you something, this France in these last days will come to nothing because of their, their their attitude and their persecution of the Huguenots back in history. Sorry if you live in France, but that's, France will come to nothing. The Tale of Two Cities. Chapter one said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But it goes on. It says it was the age of wisdom and it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of disbelief. It was the season of light. And it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. See, two contrasting things. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. Two aspects of the truth. We were all going direct to heaven, but we were all going also the other way. How prophetic is that? I mean, Charles Dickens wasn't, as far as I know, a born again Christian. But I want to tell you, that day God had hold of his pen when he penned those words. We're now facing the greatest darkness the world has ever faced and the greatest light. That's just what he said, the tale of two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And we need to understand what has caused these conditions in the earth. You know, the theory of evolution is so flawed that even a child could see through it. And, you know, but the spirit of deception rules in our educational systems. The spirit of antichrist rules our educational systems across the Western world in, in, a, in a great way. 
And uh, it's to the degree that we believe the most, most people in the world believe a lie, the lie of evolution. And they believe a lie. And it's because the spirit of Antichrist dominates the educational system. You know, it says in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness, because they received not a love for the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God allowed them strong delusions so that they should believe a lie. He's talking to me at the end times. Evolution is one of those the delusions and a lie. You know, uh, the theory of evolution is one of the strongest delusions that's gripping the world. You know, there's still a hundred, there's still a one million dollar reward out there who, for anyone who scientifically can prove the theory of evolution. But nobody is taking it up because they can't do it. <laughs> scientifically, they cannot do it. It's just theory after theory after theory. And they say, this happened 15 million years ago. Oh, yeah. Prove it. But they don't tell the kids that in school. It's presented as the truth, scientifically truth, scientific truth. So it's like, well, you know, what, what we're entering into now with these final blood moons, it's a whole new dispensation, a whole new dispensation. There will be nothing as like being before. You know, there have been dispensations all through the ages and, and you know, it's, uh, you know, God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. You know, sometimes we ask the hard questions, you know, well, who created God? Have you ever thought like that? And then your mind goes blank. <laughs> if everything has to have a cause, a reaction, a cause, who, who created God? God said, I'm not telling you. Right now, you are to walk by faith. These things will come to light as we go on into the ages to come. We'll understand and think, why didn't I see that before? But now the mind is blinded. And so, you know, there have been dispensation. God created the heavens and the earth. We don't have much information of this time period, except that God created the heavens above us and the earth. How long that lasted? We have no idea. Could have been for a very long time. Could have been for many millions of years. Could have been for just a hundred years. We have no way of knowing. And it cannot be proven either way, you know. God created the heavens and the earth. How long that lasted, you know. What happened when he created the heavens and the earth? Because, you know, it says in Genesis 1, 2, after this, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the face, you know, God's, the Spirit of God moves across the face of the water. It's very interesting that all of the early Syriac texts read the earth became without form and void. God created the heavens and the earth what that earth was like. Probably that was the dinosaur ages through that. We don't know how long that lasted. And the earth became without form and void. What happened? Well, there was an ice age. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> I am a creationist. <laughs> we know there was an ice age before Adam came on the scene. We know that. Historically, that's proven. There's not a problem with that. But what was that ice, what did that ice age wipe out? We don't really know. The earth became without form and void and darkness. And God said, enough, let there be light. These are dispensations and times. 
And uh, <laughs> let the earth, Genesis chapter 1 verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit trees yielding fruit after their kind and so on. The word bring forth here is a Hebrew word, dosho, which literally means to sprout. The seed was already in the ground. He said, okay, let it come forth now. See, the Bible is right all the way through. We just get it wrong sometimes in the way we look at things. I mean, there was a dinosaur age. But that absolutely was before Adam. Don't look at me like that. Getting quiet here. <laughs> Dispensations. These ages are blurred. We know little about them. You know. It says in seven days God created. Da, 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 da. Now God could do that in seven days without any sweat. But it might have been 7,000 years. But it's a year with the Lord. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. I don't know. It could have been seven days. It could have been much longer. But it doesn't matter. God created, you see. God created these, these things. We don't know how long Adam was in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, I've tried to look at that through scripture from every angle. There's no way of knowing, you know. So we start with an era. With there's Adam in the garden. He sins. He's cast out of the garden. Then we have an age from that point of time down to the flood. It's called the antediluvian age. Now, this was the problem. That's where everything started to go wrong. And uh, down to the flood. So that period was from Adam being thrown out of the Garden of Eden down to the flood was the antediluvian age. But towards the end of this age, um, from Adam to the flood, there was an age of great rebellion against God. And we know that because the Bible makes it clear. However, there was one righteous line that came all the way through, the line of Noah. A righteous line that came all the way through. Now, I, w I want you to get this. You know, it's like, because God said, Jesus said, I want you to understand what was happening in the days of Noah are going to happen in your days. He said, I want you to understand this. Take note. So, okay, we take note. You know, the next period, that period, Towards the end of that antediluvian age, from Adam to the flood, there was a great rebellion. And um, down to the age of Noah. You know, to flood the whole earth and wipe out the whole of the human race is pretty severe. I mean, to say the least, <laughs> you know. The entire human race. God says, no, I'm going to take out the whole human race except for one family. What went wrong for God to do that? You know? As a, I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah is one thing. It's just a city. But take out the entire human race? What was going on? You see? We need to understand this. God actually said this. He said, I'm sorry that I created the human race. That's what he said. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I created humans on this earth. That is something, you know. Why would he say that? I mean, you know, what was going on? Well, problem started with a bunch of fallen angels sexually interacting with human women and producing giants in the earth. Like it or not, God said, you, Jesus said, you need to understand this age because it's going to happen in your day and age. 
Okay, and so this caused changes in the human DNA. And the human race now, apart from one line, the human race was no longer in the image and likeness of God. It was no longer human. There was a mixed seed. And God said, if I allow this to happen, it will contaminate generation after generation after generation, and all has to go. And we'll start again with one family. It says in Genesis 6 that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, they were fair. The women were very beautiful, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. He said, now this has happened, I'm going to limit your, life, the, the, your lifespan. We don't want too many born. Too many creatures which are not human born this way. I'm going to limit your lifespan for a start. So drop from about people were living eight, 900 years to this, you know, 120 years. The problem is when these angels had relationships with human women, it says they produced giants. Because Genesis 6, 4 says, and there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, now these sons of God, we are sons of God today because Jesus died on the cross and we have his nature. They didn't have that back then. All right, these sons of God were sons of God in heaven the children of God, but there were angels in heaven. Okay? Now the sons of God, it says, there were giants in the earth in those days, after the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bore children unto them. So you got these angels, humans, interacting, bearing children, which turned out, because of the angelic side, falling as giants in the land. All right. When the sons of God came into the daughters of Mombo children, the same became mighty men which were of old and renowned. And God saw that the wickedness, this wickedness was great in the earth and that every imagination of their hearts was evil. And he said, I have repented the Lord that he made the human race. Isn't that something? Say, God repent. He was sorry that he had made the human race because of what had happened to them. The human race had been made in the image and likeness of God. They no longer had that image. They had the wrong a mix of DNA. Jesus said, now listen, the same conditions are going to be at the end of this age, right now, the age in which we're living. Everything is being set up right now for this whole scene to begin to happen again. So, one family was walking in righteousness. See, this new breed emerged, which was part human and part fallen angel. Now, if they kept breeding, and they kept breeding, and their children kept breeding, what would the human race end up like? God said, enough, I've got to stop this right now. We've got to kill them all, except one family. It's very severe. These were called, the children that were produced were called Nephilim. This produced giants of great evil. You know, in the days of Lot, in Jude 1, 7, it says, even in Sodom and Gomorrah, in the book of Jude, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and strange flesh. I set forth for example of suffering. The word strange flesh here is from the Greek, which means it has a meaning of a different generic breed. You know, the depravity reached the depths that were so great because they were interacting now with animals. God says, enough. I'm going to wipe out these two cities. 
before this goes any further. Let me tell you today, this is happening in virtually every Western nation in the world today. It's happening in England, it's happening in Australia, it's definitely happening in America. And the legislation that is before the Supreme Court right now to be able to marry your animals, it's just part of this whole iceberg of equal rights. There's also application to um, have chimpanzees equal rights with humans. It's there, you can, you can find it, it's there, it's out there now. I know it's unsavory, There's a, but good is coming. But you need to know, these are the days in which we live. That's why God says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this to an end, you know? I'm gonna judge these nations. They legalize them, legalize it, God has to judge it. So, God had no other option except for one family. See, the children that were born, which were called Nephilim, were, were the, the, the children that were born were wiped out in the flood, right? But they were half human and half angelic. They had a human spirit. And when they died, their spirit, in the flood, their spirits came out of them, obviously. And they are where demons came from. They are unclean spirits, and that's where, that, they are demons. Angels and demons are totally different breeds. They're not even close. People kind of classify them together, you know, fallen angels and demons. No, they're not. They're different altogether. These were the spirits that came out of the Nephilim when they were killed in the flood. Unclean spirits. And many of them appear in forms even of animals. Because that's what they were part of too as well. See? It all makes sense, doesn't it? God says, no, can't let this happen. But it's happening again. Oh, hallelujah. So demons are not angels. They're not fallen angels. Demons are earthbound. They can't get off the earth. See? Equal rights. Homosexuality opens the door to a huge iceberg underneath. See, once a nation legislates, breaks the God-given boundaries in sexual relationships, it opens the door to all, all other kinds of relationships everywhere. having equal rights with animals. 6,000 years of recorded history where marriage has always been between a man and woman has now been overturned. The giants were born called Nephilim. You know, These Nephilim have also interbred with humans on the earth. The Nephilim, we still have Nephilim, some Nephilim in the earth. And they've interbred with humans. And, well, you know, the Anakims, remember the Anakims in scripture? They were all a race of giants. And, it, and Goliath was one of them. And he had five brothers who were also giants. So what had happened since the, after the flood? What had happened, you see? You know this whole thing of alien abduction? That is the same demonic realm. Trying to re reproduce you see, angels cannot reproduce, trying to reproduce. 
taking, interfering with the sperm of humans, alien inductions. Not aliens. You have fallen angels. You know the gay agenda has now come up saying, came out saying there's nothing wrong with pedophilia. Very interesting. You get that picture ready, wherever you are. Very interesting. There was a group of American special forces in Afghanistan on a mission, and they were on a mountainous, mountainous area, and they were in a certain spot, and they came across this guy throwing boulders at them, which were this big. What boulders at them? And they looked up at this guy, you know, and this guy was hurling huge boulders down on them. And of course, these special forces re responded and shot the guy. But when they got closer, they could not believe their eyes. Do we have a picture of that somewhere? That's the guy. They're the American forces. See? That's the guy they shot. That didn't hit the news in America. That's enough, I think. <laughs> OK. Oh. The days that lie ahead of us. Aren't you glad that Noah rose above the storm and rose above it? Jesus said, you need to know about this because it's going to happen in your day and age. That's why I'm telling you, I don't like to preach this kind of stuff. You know, it's a bit unsavory. But Jesus said, you need to know. Ah, you can't put your head in the sand, you know, like an ostrich. Isaiah said, behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Darkness shall cover the earth, but, I'm glad for the but, but the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you. <laughs> Hallelujah. For behold, the people shall arise, as the glory of the Lord shall be, arise upon you and people shall come to your glory and it shall be seen upon you the Gentiles shall come to your light. God is allowing this and it's setting the scene for the greatest harvest the world and the church has ever known. It's coming. Oh, hallelujah. Lift up your eyes round about and see they will gather themselves together and come to you for help. And whosoever in those days shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all it takes. Hallelujah. Oh, lift up your eyes round about and see. They will gather together, come to you. It says, and then, Isaiah 16 verse 8, and then you will see and flow together and your heart, and your heart shall fear the Lord and be enlarge because... The abundance of the sea, the sea always in scripture speaks of humanity, because the abundance of humanity shall be converted unto you. And the forces of the Gentiles shall come to you. Hallelujah. These are days are right ahead of us now. Ha ha ha. David took out some of the Nephilim. And you know, it's very interesting. He said, I don't come against you with a sword and a shield. Okay? It says, you know, he said, in 1 Samuel 17, 45, David said to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the, in the name 
not just the name of the Lord, but the name of the Lord of his hosts, his angels. And David had good understanding of the angel of the Lord in battle. He said, I'm coming against you, you're a giant. And I'm, you know, David wasn't a very tall guy. He said, but I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, of angels. And I always envisage, you know, he put this stone. It's very interesting because he took five stones. He was going to take out all his brothers. <laughs> Goliath had five brothers. Took up five. Anyway, that, that was what David was like. You know, I always might, and he's flung that stone. He could, right, you know, you'll get it. And he let go, and the angel grabbed it and went, fuck. <laughs> Nothing had entered that guy's head before, but that day <laughs> it did. The Lord of hosts is with us, and we've taken out the Nephilim. Hallelujah. Your armed forces are going to be up against some very heavy stuff. You need to pray for them. Once this current uh, government has changed and you have a different president, and please pray that Hillary Clinton does not get in. You do not want a witch in the White House. I'm serious. Anyway, your armed forces are going to need your prayer. You're going to need help from above. Oh, <laughs> I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, and this day he will deliver you into my hands. God is going to give great authority in these days. Great authority. See, there are more for us than they that are against us. We've got to keep that in mind. There are more that are for us than they that are against us. And it says in 2 Kings 6, 18 in this battle, and when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, smite these people blind, and he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. I tell you, there are hordes are going to come even against the church, and the church will have the authority to say, you are blind at least for a season. And stop a whole mob coming against the church. There are going to be mighty weapons of warfare which we've never had before. Hallelujah. Oh. We must lose the fear of death. We're at the end of the age. Look, to die in, for a warrior of the Lord to die in battle is a, has a great reward. Listening to me? Great honor. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. In this final battle, God's going to empower his two people like never before. Great authority is going to be given. I had an encounter with Joshua last month. He came into my room and talked to me about these final battles. It was very amazing. You know, and he talked to me about some of the, the weapons of warfare. And he talked about the ability to become invisible to the enemy. I said to him, scripture please. And he said, haven't you read where Jesus walked through the multitude and they never saw him? He walked through the whole crowd. They couldn't see him. I thought, whoa, that was cool. I thought, <laughs> you know. 
We're going to have mighty weapons. We don't have to fear. You know? Oh. The sum of the tools that God is going to give us are incredible. Incredible tools. You know? The angels will be with us. You've got to remember this. The angels will always be with us. And they have the ability to turn a whole mob blind just with the flick of a finger. And God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hey, we got to trust the Lord, eh? You know? God has reserved the greatest weapons for this generation. You know? However, all judgments of God are motivated by love. They are redemptive. However, the Nephilim cannot be redeemed. Okay? They have to be taken out. You know, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, don't be soon shaken in mind and troubled, or by, neither by spirit or by a word or by letters from us, to the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall come, that day shall not come except it comes a falling away and that the man of sin be revealed. You are going to be here when the man of sin is revealed. Don't let anybody tell you you're going to be raptured before that. It ain't going to happen. It's not the truth. You'll see this Antichrist revealed. Why would we be told not to take the mark if we're not going to be here? Come on. You know, Great falling away. What is that? You know, theologians, and there's some, they're probably right in part, they said, well, in the dark ages there was a great falling away. And that was true. There was a great falling away during the dark ages. And the church went into apostasy and so on. And there was, there's some truth in that. But the main import of that is in these last days. And let me tell you something which I was shown clearly by the Lord. And um, it, it, it's like, it's a bit, it, it's just frightening, you know. Judgment is coming. And there's going to be a lot of disillusioned Christians. And said, you, they'll say, you said this couldn't happen to us. And there'll be a great falling away. And I saw this in three phases. Each time there was a falling away, the church became brighter, more glorious. The second time there was a falling away, it became even more bright, but the church became seemingly smaller, but greater. This happened three times. The first, I'm pretty sure, was the economy, the collapse of the economy. I'm not too sure what the other two events were that called the falling away. But many Christians, because they've been taught a lie, will be so disillusioned. And Paul writes about this, you see. There'll be a great falling away. And I thought, well... And secondly, before the harvest begins, the tares have to be taken out of the church. Not out of the world. Out of the church. All right? You with me? Then the harvest can come in. See, there will be a falling away. You know, this, this world is undergoing a shift in power and control that is unprecedented in history. You know? And we need to lay aside the things which are unimportant and streamline our lives to make in the years that we have left count for the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know? We are not here that many teachers are teaching to, fulf you see, to fulfill your dreams. God wants you to fulfill your dreams. No, he doesn't. He wants you to fulfill his dream. Yeah. That's right. That's why we are here. It's not about our dreams. 
It's about his dream for redeeming mankind. He died for this. He has a dream of a new world. And we're here to help him fulfill his dream, not our dream. It's not about us, it's about him. We have to, we're here to help him get his inheritance in the earth, not ours. I get so tired of this teaching, you know. You know, you can make it, you can do this in God, you can do anything. You can be blessed, you can be wealthy, you can be rich. It's not about you. It's about him. Very few people can be trusted with wealth. Christians. That's why most of them don't have it. It's not about us. It's his dream. We have to fulfill. The, the cross is not preached anymore. We have to die so that he might live in through us and in the earth. That's what it's about. You know, in the midst of the darkness, the greatest spiritual harvest we have, and it's unimaginable how many people are going to come into the kingdom of God. Unbelievable. But you know, God, because most Christians and people in the world, but also most Christians have their security in wealth, finance. And you say, oh, that's not true. Well, just take it, have someone take it away and see. Yeah. True, it's our security is very much tied to finance. God says, okay, I'm going to remove it. So you'll not be able to buy or sell. Ha ha. Now you're going to trust the Lord. The last prop of security, God is going to come along and just kick it out. Boink. Now, we have to trust the Lord. That'll be exciting. You run out of food, and you put your, your plate out, knife and fork out, set the table and pray, and it'll appear. Amen. Only if your faith and trust is in the Lord. Hallelujah. It's going to be exciting. That's the final test of our security, being transferred to the Lord. Revelation 13, 7, And no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark of the name of the beast and the number of his name. If at all possible, you really need to get out of debt as quickly as you can. If you can't, then you've got to help, ask God to help you, you know? If you're sincere before God, but, you know. And secondly, you need to sow now while you have money. Because the measure of your sowing will be reaped when money disappears and God will take care of you. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. I'm not taking an offering tonight. That's not why I'm saying that. I, I don't believe in all that stuff. I'm talking to you to help you. Sow now. Sow now. Because the time is coming where you can't sow. And we can only reap what we sow. The days that lie ahead. It's no longer business as usual. Jesus said, when these things come to pass, look up, for your redemption is very close. You know? I just wanted, what's the time here? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to talk to you a little about the false prophet and the false church. A year ago, I had an encounter with the Lord, and it was a very powerful encounter. And, um, he said to me, he said, I want you to watch for something. He said, when the present Pope will address the United Nations and Congress, it will be the beginning of the rise of the false church. Now, 
I thought, well, okay. Uh, you know, in Revelation 13, 11, it says, and beheld another beast coming up out of the earth who had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He had the nature of a lamb, but underneath was a dragon. I thought, okay, and he exercised all the power of the first beast and caused the earth and them to dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. And he did great wonders, signs and wonders, so that maketh fire to come down from heaven and deceiving them that dwell on the earth because of those miracles. So this beast, this false prophet, false prophet had a, a horns of a lamb and spoke, but spoke like a dragon. Last year, um, a year ago, the Lord spoke to me about this. And uh, this year, during the last phases of the blood moons, the Pope, this present Pope, will be addressing the United Nations. And then after that, he will be addressing your Congress. Now it's getting quiet. I quote, the United Nations is announcing that Pope Paul Francis will address the annual UN General Assembly of the World Leaders on September the 25th during the first papal visit to the United States. That's right after Yom Kippur, the week, that same week, coming into the Feast of Tabernacles. That September, the, the September speech will mark the first time ever that the head of the world's Roman Catholic Church will address Congress. Pope Francis is also expected to have a White House meeting with President Barack Obama. The United Nations says that the Pope will also meet with the Secretary of the UN on his day to this visit to this world body. Wednesday's statement welcomed the Pope's visit as an important part of a historic year in which the United Nations marks its 70th anniversary. Hey. You know, you've got to be careful of lambs and sheep in wolves' clothing. Or the other way around, wolves and sheep clothing. When this takes place, millions of Catholics are going to come into the kingdom of God. They'll be so disillusioned. Millions will come in. You know, these are the days in which we're living. You see, religion has been seen as the cause of the problems in the world today. And there's some truth to that. Most of the wars have started on a religious basis. You know, and or with, with religious undertones, you know. And many leaders today believe that a world unified church that does not include Judaism is the answer and will bring the nation's peace. The world church will include all of the world's religions except Judaism and Christianity. Interesting. And this meeting will be the catalyst of that beginning. Our greatest problem is really initially it's not going to be with the Antichrist, it's going to be with the false church. Because legislation will come in that if you're not part of it, you cannot marry anyone, you cannot bury anyone, you can't do any of these official things unless you are part of that false church. Oh, I don't, I don't, I could still marry people, it wouldn't worry me, because marriage is between the couple and God, not the state. You know, I believe in marriage because, this, because of inheritance things and states, and that you need to do it that right way. But when that's not possible, you can still marry people. But all this kind of legislation, churches will be taxed at the highest rate ever of income tax in the United States, Christian churches, in an attempt to wipe them out. But it'll only make them stronger. <laughs> it really will. 
Oh, I tell you, hallelujah. These are exciting times. <sighs> yeah. Two natures, a lamb and a dragon. This false church will have great political power, clout. And this false church will strongly advocate the mark of the beast. That's what the scripture says. So, we're coming to the end real quick. Quicker than we think. This won't affect the true church. It will rise in greater power and glory and strength to the dismay of the false church as millions of people come into the kingdom of God. It's like it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the darkest times, it was the lightest times. It was a group going to hell, it was a group going to heaven. It gets better. I'll, I'll, my next message will be better than that. <laughs> great darkness and great light. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The economic will be the first wave, which is very close, closer than most people think. The economies of the world are about set to go down again, but this time far worse than the last time, okay? And uh, there'll be storms of lawlessness right across your nation. But if you really put your trust in the Lord, God is well able to protect you. I saw churches being... Uh, mobs advancing on the church to, to try and dismantle and destroy and set the church on fire and they instantly became blind. That's what Joshua showed me. Hey, we can trust God. Now listen, even if we lose our lives, it's no big deal. We're at the end of the age anyway. Come on. If you get killed in the army of the Lord and fighting for the Lord, you just join the army on the other side. Yeah. Come on, the fear of death's got to go. You know? I can understand Paul. He said, you know, I want to go. He said, I'd rather stay there. I want to go now, but it's convenient, more convenient for me to be here for you. But he said, if I have a choice, I'm going. That should be our attitude. I've always said to the Lord, when my mission is finished, then not one day longer before you take me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be here to the coming of the Lord. But that's our attitude. You know, you get shot in the head, it's no big deal. You won't feel anything. It's real quick. <laughs> You get shot in the head and it's blank. You're out of your body and you're on your way. God showed me the martyrs. Remember the arena? And I, I was taken back to show. I was amazed. They was, I thought, I was amazed first that there was no fear. And they were about to release the lions, you know, in the arena. And they were singing hymns and glorifying God. And I thought, what's wrong with these people, you know? <laughs> and so I watched this very carefully. And I said, now watch. And so I watched this. And just before the lions got even to touch them, their spirit was out of their body. Yeah. Gone. And I thought, that will do. <laughs> you know? I'm serious. That's exactly as it happened. Some will die, 
But that's, that, 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 that's all right. We've got to lose the fear of death. It's just a transition into a, the real world. <sighs> oh. We come into the Feast of Tabernacles. I'll enlarge a bit more on this and I'll draw to a close now. But you know, the early church kept Passover, right? Born again. They kept the Feast of Pentecost, baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? But they did not keep the Feast of, Pen of Tabernacles. They kept, went into decline before that happened, that could happen. The early church did not keep experience the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. In, in these recent years, we've had Pentecost. We've had born-again experience, right? We've kept the Feast of Passover. We've had the Pentecost experience, which was highlighted in the charismatic move 40 years ago. Now it's changing. This last blood moon in Tabernacles ushers in a new era. And just as your experience of being born again was real to you, and just as your baptism of the Holy Spirit is real to you, there's another experience coming which will be just as real, even more real. And that is the era we're now entering into. And he's going to have a glorious church. Oh, hallelujah. Feast of Tabernacles brings us to the end of the age. You know, I'll just go, it's all right if I go another 10, 15 minutes. Yes. Two years ago, the Lord spoke to me, and if you're listening on this from in the UK, you know, I was born in the UK, and... Um, England is earmarked for a massive revival and massive judgment. You know, not, the judgment will not be as severe as it is in America because America is a covenant nation. Two nations, Israel and America, your founders covenanted by God to obey the Bible and walk in his ways. Okay, that is serious when you break that. But anyway, you know... The British Empire was one of the most remarkable achievements in our lifetime. I'm talking to those listening in England now. When I went to school, most of the world map was red, which indicated the British Empire. And uh, there was a saying that the sun never set over the British Empire. The sun was always up somewhere in the British Empire. And... Um, what British did in the natural realm was a prophetic picture foreshadowing the next revival in England. You see, they took the English language to all of these nations. They took missionaries to all of these nations. And um, it was not just a military thing, but it paved the way. You know, before Jesus came, it says, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. The Romans built shipping routes all over the world. They built roads all over the world. Then Jesus came so the disciples could take those routes. In the fullness of time. See, and this was what's happening when the British Empire was spreading across the world. Commonwealth nations, the young lions are about to come forth. And today, the Lord is here today as a lamb and as a lion. I've seen him twice since I've first come in, into the building today. Now, Jesus said, from the rising of the sun to the going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered in my name. What the, what the British did in expanding their empire was a prophetic insight as to the end times. 
and it's going to happen again. And Britain is, is earmarked, you know, for a, a revival. France will come to nothing. The British Empire, this time it will be spiritual. The cross of the nations of the world. There's got to be some battles. Britain will face, face some terrible battles. But there's a revival coming. You know, when the charismatic move broke 40 years ago, most of the Pentecostal church did not embrace it. Isn't that frightening? I mean, we're supposed to be Pentecostal. Didn't embrace it, particularly in England. They said, no, no, this is of God. What we had in the past was the real thing couldn't handle change, couldn't handle moving on. The pastor who led me to the Lord, a Pentecostal pastor, couldn't handle the charismatic move and went over ministry. It's going to happen again. We're entering the Feast of Tabernacles and much of the Pentecostal church will not accept it. But we will... Hallelujah. Yeah. See, Moses sent, Joshua sent the spies out into the promised land. Twelve of them. Ten came back with the wrong message. Ten out of twelve had the wrong message when they came back. They said, we can't do it. There are Anakims out there. They're the giants in the land we talked about. It's that race of people. We can't do it. You know, earlier this year, I woke up early one morning with a breeze blowing on me. And I thought, I can't be right. You know, there's nothing in the house open. So I got up and I could still feel this breeze blowing on me. And I went around the house, nothing was open. So then it dawned on me, this must be the Lord. <laughs> I thought, well, okay, you know. I said, Lord, what is this? What is this? He said, there's a wind blowing over the church. And I said, oh, that's good. He said, no, it isn't. <laughs> he said, it is a storm of unbelief. And he said, it will cut to shreds the promises that I have given many of my people. And I thought, what? And then he started to talk to me about the spies that went in. Ten of them came back and said, we can't do it. When God said, I will be with you and I'll take you in, they said, I don't believe you. We can't do it. And they went back. They still made it to heaven, but they went back into the wilderness for 40 years and died. Never fulfilled their destiny. But they made it, but didn't fulfill their destiny. Hey, that mustn't happen to you. We have to believe. The days that lie ahead, we must trust God and obey him. And he will take care of us. We've got to learn to hear the voice of the Lord very clearly. And uh, you've, got to, uh, you've really got to ask God to teach you, the Holy Spirit to teach you to clearly hear the voice of the Lord. There's going to be a battle for your mind and it's a battle of unbelief. And it's sweeping the world. And I thought, oh, okay, okay. And I thought, well, that is good. That's good. That we know it's coming. And we can fight it. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. And this is going to sweep in when God begins to take us into a new phase in the Feast of Tabernacles and all that that entails. We haven't time to talk about it tonight. But it's far greater than a charismatic move. And a charismatic move is great. 
It's a tremendous move of God. This what's coming. We'll put that in the shade. And it's right on our doorstep now. The transaction happens this year. It's finally coming. It's finally coming. Oh, I tell you, I get so excited about this, I could go on and on. <laughs> England will become great again, but on the spiritual level. You need to pray that, that England breaks from the European Union. And I want you to pray for something very specific for England. Over a year ago, I was taken into Buckingham Palace, right into the Queen's bedroom, and spoke to her. And the Lord said, tell her that she must not let Charles come to the throne. It must be her young, his younger brother. He said, if Charles comes to the throne, it will be extremely detrimental for England. And I said, Lord, you want me to tell her that? And she's already startled with me being in a bedroom. <laughs> and I thought, Lord. She looked at me and she said, I will be breaking hundreds of years of protocol. I said, but you must do it and you can do it. And this year is critical for this. Charles is a one world government, is a new ager, and his wife Camilla, well, we don't want to talk about that, but <laughs> do, do we hide it? No. <laughs> England is there, you know, we need to pray for the Queen. Billy Graham led her to the Lord, and she's a very godly person, good person. And uh, who she appoints to follow her is critical for England. Listen to me in England, who's streaming there. You need to pray for this, that God will give her the courage and the strength to go against hundreds of years of protocol. Because it's always the older son that inherits. She has to change that. So I want you to pray, you know. This is not just about us. It's not just about your nation, our nation. We're on a world scene now. And it's really important that we, we understand some of these things. And it's like decisions are now being made this year which will have tremendous ramifications on the future in your country and in all, of, all our Western nations. And it's like, you know, we need to pray for Israel I believe Israel's going to take on ISIS. And I, I believe Israel will bomb Iran. And the whole world will turn against them. You've got to stand with them. The problem with Iran is that their bunkers have been so deep underground, their nuclear facilities, which now America is sending them hundreds of thousands of dollars and have said if Israel attacks Iran they will now tell Iran how to stop Israel attacking them sorry but that's your government present government which is not going to be there for long but it's like it's really important because you know Israel has the capacity to go right through those bunkers and they won't give the details to America. <laughs> but they have the capacity to reach right through. And which they will do. Because Iran is bent, bent on annihilating Israel. And that's a picture that this world is bent, the systems of this world are bent on annihilating the church. <laughs> Hey. false prophets abound all over your nation 
in the name of the church. We need to be very aware of the situation, and I think, sure, you know, I was praying, I was saying, Lord, what do I tell you folk, you know? I said, they've heard enough about judgment, they've heard enough about what's coming. He said, no, tell them the truth. And I said, but you know, Lord, <laughs> I said, we need to help them get through this. And I was talking to him like this. And there was a song started in the back of my head. And I was thinking, oh, for goodness sake, I'm talking to the Lord, you know? <laughs> and I said, Lord, you know, you know, you've got to help them. You've got to help. And this song kept coming. And I said, what is it? And then I heard the lyrics. When you're weary and feeling small. When tears are in your eyes, I'll dry them all. I'm on your side. When times get rough and friends just can't be found, like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay you down. When you're down and out, when you're on the street. When evening falls so hard, I will comfort you. I'll take your part. When darkness comes and pain is all around, like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. It'll provide a bridge for you. Say, sail on silver girl, the bride. Sail on by, your time has come to shine. Your dreams are on the way. See how they shine. Oh, if you need a friend, I'm sailing right behind. Like a bridge over troubled waters, I will ease your mind. Like a bridge over troubled waters, I will ease your mind. I want you to remember that. He'll become a bridge for you over troubled waters. He will lay himself down to make sure you get through. And you must become a bridge over troubled waters to other people. And I will lay you down, I'll help you through. You know, this was a secular song written by Simon Paul. And I looked up Simon Paul on the net and he said this, I don't know how I wrote this song, it wasn't me, it just came out. <laughs> I said, oh, yes. <laughs> a prophetic word for America, this song. Prophetic word for you. Like a bridge over troubled waters. He will be our bridge. He will be your bridge. And he'll get you through. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to his word. We cannot, this is not a bad time to abandon God's truth and the word of God. We cannot compromise truth. God's word is God's word. No matter what people think about us, it's still God's word and we stand and defend it. Many Pentecostal churches now will not take a stand against homosexuality. In fact, I won't go there. Not good. We must take a stand. Hallelujah. There's some great things ahead. The best of times. Hallelujah. Great light in the midst of great darkness. And you can do it. There is a grace when we enter into the Feast of Tabernacles. There will be a new grace available to get you into and through that phase. And it will be poured out upon the church of grace, a new kind of grace, you know. And it'll be like the lion, and it'll be like the lamb, those two natures. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, 
We know your word is true. It's truth and Lord, we cannot compromise truth for the sake of being popular. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, you said, but the end is the ways of death. I pray for every person here tonight. I pray for those who are hearing this being streamed to them. These are the days which Jesus talked about. The days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you said, Lord, that these days would be the same in the days in which we are now living. The horror and the great darkness. But these are your people, Lord. They're here because they want to be here and they want to follow you through. And you said, Lord, that you said, Lord, that they, you will become a, bra- a bridge for them over troubled waters, just like Noah sailed above the storm and when it was over came in, out into a brand new world. So, Lord, you will be to them who trust you. You will be to them as a bridge over troubled waters. And over the next few years here in America, the waters will be troubled, greatly troubled. But the Republic will rise again. And be a foundation of truth. I pray for everybody here, Lord, and healing this streaming, that you will strengthen them as they lean upon you, that you'll strengthen them in faith and in love and in courage. And as the winds of unbelief sweep across the church, that your people will rise above that and say, no, your word is true. We will not compromise your word. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to them in dreams. Speak to them through your word. Encourage them. And that your great grace will be upon them. To bring them through, Lord, that these next few years... greatest time ever in church history lies ahead of us now and the harvest will be great let your grace Lord be upon them let your grace be upon them, strengthen them, give them courage he is saying to you be of good courage be of good courage you can take the land be of good courage You need the tenacity, the fierceness of a lion, and you need the heart of a lamb. And I pray, Lord, for impartation, impartation, impartation into them, I pray. In Jesus' name. Let there be an impartation of courage, strength, faith, understanding, and wisdom. And the strength not to compromise. Or I ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.